in, in every aspect of the negotiations, then it's not going to be anywhere near far enough to go to get to what we need for gender and women. Thank you. Yeah, it certainly affects all the signaling, not least, in terms of whether this is important or not. Um, any last words, Agatha? I just uh, wanted, I'm inside of the negotiations as a negotiator, so I can let you know what security is in, without brackets, so far, and also gender, so far. So we're with uh, several of the countries trying to get those two important things on the agreement, but we're fighting for them. I just want to let you like a little hope. <laughs> at least. Good luck. <laughs> I wish there was more we could do to help. Um, thank you so much. Um, and could I turn briefly to uh, Michael Halo, who's the director of uh, the uh, Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation, ACPEU, um, which is uh, based in Brussels, right? Um, and uh, um, he's going to say just a few closing words and reflections on, on this whole morning. Um, can we give you a microphone? Or do you want? Okay, you got one. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have come to the end of a very uh, lively and uh, informative morning, so I, I really don't want to take your time to stand between you and the lunch and try to summarize what was said. I think everyone was very uh, actively engaged in the discussion this morning. I just would like to um, highlight some of the messages, at least, that came to me personally from these discussions. Well, I think it was clear from everyone the, that we're looking at a huge uh, problem. In terms of the magnitude of the problem, it's huge. We have to produce more food, 70% more, and reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture. So everyone recognized that. And if you go into any kind of discussion, if you go to Africa or any, anywhere else in the developing world, there is a lot more demand on agriculture to create jobs, to improve nutrition, and all sorts of uh, expectations from agriculture. So the question is, how much policy coherence do we have in terms of trying to achieve these common objectives and also trying to address the climate challenge? So at least at these negotiations, I think what we have heard this morning is there is uh, agriculture is important, it's being recognized, it's appearing in some form in the negotiations, and more importantly in the INDCs, which will probably in the end determine what's going to happen uh, nationally, agriculture is in there. I think it was clear that the quality of the INDCs is variable, there are huge data gaps, some important elements are missing, gender and use, and so on. So there is still a lot of work to be done. And I think from our, my perspective, I'm not sure if the people who are actually developing the INDCs are also very familiar with the challenges that we face in the agricultural sector. So this whole issue of multi-sectoral approach, how do you make sure that the challenges of food security, sustainability, and so on are taken into account in the INDCs in a meaningful way. And, and I think the point that was made about what really matters is implementation, because we could have lots of agreements, we could have conventions, we could have documents, plans, and so on. But what matters in the end is how are we going to implement it? And to make that implementation happen, do you have the financial resources, uh, in, in the, especially for developing countries? And it was clear from the uh, CCAF's report that the requirements are quite enormous, $5 billion a year, both for adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation. Yes, uh, Green Climate Fund is there, and it's not being used effectively. So that could provide some of the resources, and other resources might be uh, forthcoming. But you heard also yesterday at the, at the, pl at the opening plenary that uh, the Nigerian former uh, uh, finance minister was saying it's unlikely we'll see much of this money coming. So I think there is this whole issue of is the, is the finance going to be available? Then the next one is the technical capacity building, the research, and so on. Do the farmers have the technology that they need to make, you know, to be able 
uh, to uh, adapt their systems. I think this morning we had a lot of discussion about what private sector, especially the big companies, are doing to try and reduce their food, uh, their carbon footprint. I think largely driven by consumer demand and their interest in sustainable sourcing. What we haven't heard much is how, you know, especially the smallholder farmers, how are they going to be able to adapt? How are we going to provide them the resources, the capacity, the organization? And uh, Theo de Jager mentioned it, you know. Um, from their perspective, it's a question of survival in terms of uh, being able to continue farming, to feed their families, and also to provide food for the large part of the population in, in, in Africa who have 80% of the food coming from smallholder farmers. So I think th there was a, a bit of a gap in that discussion. Maybe this morning we focused a bit more on the mitigation side, at least from my perspective. So I think the, the question in the future is how do we refocus our efforts, especially from the CGIR perspective to provide technologies and, and support and government policies and so on, finance as well, to help smallholders to adapt to these changes. So in the end, the whole issue of partnership has come out very clearly, you know, the importance of public-private partnerships, the need for individuals to act, consumers in the developed world to continue pushing for sustainable uh, food production systems, looking at the entire value chain, not just at the production side of things. And the whole issue of engaging young people, you know, engaging, uh, you know, also focusing on the gender issue. So this is a real big agenda that, that requires everyone's inputs and everyone's change of mind. So in the end, it has to be completely transformational. It, it reminds me of uh, a famous scientist, you know, uh, which you all know, of saying insanity is like doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So I think we have to get away from that and really be uh, you know, quite revolutionary in the way we look at things. But is that going to happen? I think that's a big question that we ha all have to face and, and try to work towards. But definitely science, innovation, and research is a promising uh, uh, contribution that could actually change the equation, I mean, in a way. If we have, I mean, technology has been able to provide the food that we wanted, uh, in, in, in the last 50 years. So I hope and uh, I'm confident that it will help us to address also this big challenge in the future. So on, the be on behalf of the organizers, um, CGR CCAFs, uh, the uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Fanarpan, um, I might be missing somebody there. Uh, I think the Knowledge Development Network, uh, and all, of course on my own behalf, and the CTA we are very, uh, Grateful to the speakers, the high-level speakers, and everyone who contributed uh, in a passionate way to this discussion this morning. It was absolutely informative. We had a lot of information, as I say, a lot of ideas and, and contributions. We are very grateful to that. Grateful to Elwin for excellent uh, uh, facilitation. Uh, you're really able to drive the discussion. When we started this morning, Sunday morning, I wasn't sure exactly how it will proceed but he did a fantastic job of keeping everyone um, really involved and, and, and interested. So thank you very much. And it also took a lot of effort from many of our colleagues to put this together, CCAF's colleagues and also some of our you know, other organizations' colleagues to put together the speakers and, and the program and so on. So I thank them for their contribution as well. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope uh, this discussion will continue and. Uh, uh, will be able to strengthen agriculture's role in the negotiations as well as outside of the negotiations. Thank you very much and have a good uh, afternoon.